All right, here's what I want you to do. I would love for you to grab a pen and a piece of paper, or if you're an electronic person, do that. If you don't have paper, use your neighbor's forehead. That is totally fine. But this is what I would love for you to do. I would love for you to write down a question that you hope gets answered in our time together. Now you may go, I don't have any questions. Okay, but I'd like you to write down a question that you hope gets answered um, in this power track. Because I'm guessing as you look through the power tracks, I mean, something attracted you to this, and it may have been these babies right here, right? But I mean, it was probably something else. Yeah, that was awkward, wasn't it? I'll never do that again. Okay, but anyway, what is a, what is a question that you kind of hope gets answered as it relates to the subject of spiritual warfare or this whole idea of how can I not get over sin? And I put those two things together because I think they go together. question that you hope um, gets answered. Now let's do some of them out loud. So it's possible you wrote down something that you would just not want anybody else to know. That's okay. But give, give me some of the things that you maybe wrote down as to reasons why this idea of spiritual war warfare is an interesting subject to you. Anybody? Yeah. What's the easiest way to fight the uh, what's the easiest way to fight the temptation? Hopefully we'll get there. And if we don't, throw something at me. Just do it before the world ends. Okay? Yeah? The real root of temptations and sin. I, I got the temptation and sin, but the I got deep, the... The deep root of... Oh, the deep root of temptation and sin. Right? Because that's the problem. If we don't get to the deep root of it, what do we do? We just, like, deal with symptoms instead of getting down to the deep root. Yeah? That? So like, what point is it? Is it just part of human nature or is it something that, that the devil is actually doing and trying to decipher those two things? Uh, I have a story that I've told a bunch of times, and so if you've ever heard me talk, you've probably already heard it before, but I had a friend in college, and uh, he was a really tall basketball player, and uh, he literally kept breaking his foot. I think he broke his foot like three times in college. And so I remember he came in my room, and he just said, Scott, i got to ask you a question. And I'm like, what? And he just said, uh, is it Satan that keeps breaking my foot because God wants me to play basketball and be able to use that to tell other people about Jesus? Or is God breaking my foot telling me to stop having and stop worshiping basketball? And I said, hey, I'm sorry, I gotta go. I don't, I don't know how to answer the question, right? Because in some respects, sometimes it's hard to know what those things are. So that's a little bit different than what you said. But still, this idea of how do we interpret these things that come in and when is Satan attacking us? Okay, good. What else? Anything else? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Here, and then we'll come there, John. Go ahead. How do you know when it's casting your pearls before swine when you stop? Oh, how do you know when it's casting your pearls before swine and when to stop? Okay. Yeah, that's a tough one, right? So there are different ways that people look at this. And there are some people who have written books in the past. And the whole idea is if you go out to your car, how many of you drive? All right, for the rest of you, when you go out to your scooter, uh, when you go out to your scooter and your scooter tire is flat, why is your scooter tire flat? Maybe it was Satan making your scooter tire flat. Or maybe the tire just got flat, right? So how, how do you tell the difference between those things and no? Anybody else? I just want to make sure that we're heading in the, in the right direction before we go. All right, cool. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I ignored you. Knowing that in this life, like, it's a continuous cycle and that you're not going to be perfect, how do you stay positive and keep improving? Oh, my word, yeah. Did you catch that? Right? I mean, it's, it's the cycle. And so how do, we, how do we deal effectively with sin without, like, killing ourselves down and beating ourselves down when we go in this cycle of, 
And, and uh, I would say raise your hand, but I won't, but I'll raise both of my hands because it happens to me all the time. And so I get caught up in some kind of a sin, and uh, I truly am st and before God, usually like on my face, like crying, I'm like, God, I'm sorry, I did it again, I can't believe I did it again, I promise you that was the last time. And then a couple of weeks, hours later maybe, right? I mean, maybe it's weeks, maybe it's hours, maybe it's days, all of a sudden I find myself back in that same struggle again. So hopefully this is some of the stuff that we're going to try to tackle today. Now here's the deal. What I wish I had for you is I wish I had the golden key. Right? Or I had the password. Don't you hate it when you show up someplace and there's Wi-Fi but it's protected? Right? And it's locked and you're like, what's the use of Wi-Fi without the code? Well, this is partly the same thing. I mean, what's the use of this if we don't have the secret code or the passcode to be able to answer these questions? And here's what I'm getting ready to tell you. I think there is one. The problem is it's not an easy one. And when we actually start looking at it here in a second, you're going to be like, that's it? I was hoping for something different. But all I'm telling you is I think God's word tells us what to do. So one of the things that I think we should always do is anytime we're trying to figure out how we're supposed to live this life, I think the best place to go is the person of Jesus Christ. And you're like, we're at a church conference. Of course you're going to say that. Well, you know what? I would say it anytime. I honestly think the best place that we can go to figure out what to do is to look at what Jesus did. So if you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And there's a crazy story in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. So here's what happens. Jesus, right? If we're going to try to figure out how we're supposed to handle sin and temptation, a really good place to go is to take a look at the person of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the interesting thing. Sometimes when we look at this, we go, well, how can Jesus really be the example for my life? I mean, he was God. I mean, I'm not God. Well, sometimes when my hair looks really, really good, maybe, right? But I mean, I'm not God. And so how can we go and how can Jesus truly be an example for my life if I can't do what he did? And I can't be who he was. But here's the crazy thing about what happened with the person of Jesus Christ. For us, we have a mediator. We have somebody who stands in the way of full attacks from Satan. I don't know if you knew that or not. But we've got somebody who stands in the way. Jesus had nobody standing in the way. So yes, he was God, but he got the full force of everything that Satan could throw at him. And you and I don't have that. And yet, even though he got the full thrust of what Satan was throwing against him, Jesus used one way to fight temptation. So let's, let's read it. Chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, man does not live on bread alone. So let me tell you something very interesting about that part right there so far. Now, why is it that Jesus didn't eat anything? I'm not sure. Maybe he was fasting, right? Maybe the idea was that he wanted to spend time with his father, and so he decided to go away and not eat for a while. But here's what I think is interesting about this. Satan likes to attack you in areas of weakness. So let's go Jesus for a second, right? So he, he was like you and I. I think he liked hot sauce and his ketchup, just like I do. I don't know. But he needed to eat. And so what happens is Satan goes and attacks him after 40 days of not eating. So it's very possible that Satan is going to do the exact same thing in your life. I'm not talking about food, but I'm talking about those times and those places in your life where you're weak or you're vulnerable. That's, that's the reason why I'm not sure there's any secret key to this thing about what Satan does. Because Satan is so schemy and he knows our weaknesses that he's going to use those things to go after us. And so for some of us, it may be sexual things. For others of you, that, that doesn't even matter to you. And so he's going to go after your pride. Because some of us are really prideful people. Some of it's insecurities that you have. And there's other people in this room that's like, insecurity? I don't even know how to spell that word. I mean, I'm like really secure. Well, then, then Satan's probably not going to attack you in those areas. Unless he's going to go after your pride. But maybe that's what it is. And so he goes at us in all kinds of different ways. Which is why I think it's really, really important that we even know our weaknesses. Or we know those areas where we can be tempted. But what does Jesus do? Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. 
Verse 5. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I, give, I will give you all their authority and splendor. For it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Keep going. The devil led him, in, uh, led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point in the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from there. For it is written, he will commend his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now that was a lot of words, right? How about you tell me? What, you tell me what that portion of scripture has to do with facing temptation and spiritual warfare. What do you see? Um, we have to use scripture. <laughs> I told you I wish there was like a better golden key, right? Like if you just do this or there's like this ocean and if I if you buy it, you can just sprinkle it somewhere and everything's going to be taken care of. I'm going to tell you something. The way that Jesus Christ stood up against temptation was to quote scripture. So if that's part of the equation, what do you and I have to do? What's that? Okay, we got to read it. We have to know what it says. What else can we do with the, with the word? Okay, good. Don't, don't forget it. What else can we do? So we can read it? Yeah? Memorize it. Yeah, that's hard, right? How many of you did like did a wanna when you were younger or any, anything like that? Yeah, right? And you memorized all these verses? Is it not crazy? Now, I'm not saying you can do it perfectly, but is it not crazy that you still remember today parts of those verses that you memorized as a kid? Not all of them, right? but I'm just saying they're there. And I find it interesting. God's word will never return void. And I think about this with my, uh, my grandma and my grandpa. Both of them suffered like from Alzheimer's. You know, if you've ever had somebody in your family that does that, it just like breaks your heart because you like look at them and they look like the same person, but they look back at you with blank eyeballs because they, they, they don't know anything, right? So it could be lunchtime and I could ask my grandfather, what did you have for breakfast? And he's like, I don't know, <laughs> right? I mean, he just has no memory. But you start to do, you start some reference of scripture and my grandpa could rattle it off like no tomorrow. <laughs> you ask my grandpa how old he was, he could not remember but if you said John 3, 16, but, I mean, it, 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 it's crazy. God's word can do amazing things in your life. And so the problem is that you and I, I don't take time to put it in. So you and I have to take time to put it. So yes, we can read it. And yes, it's really, really nice because now we walk around with it in our pocket probably. But you know what? If it doesn't make it from in here to in here and in here, then it's not going to make any difference. And so by the time that we are confronted with temptation then by then it's, all, it's almost too late. But when we have God's word, that's why God's word says, I'm going to hide his word in my heart so that I what? Do not sin against God. So here's the hard part. Just about like anything, it's going to take work and it's going to take discipline. And so as I was thinking about this and preparing this, all of a sudden I started thinking, well, when's the last time I memorized a verse of scripture? It's been a long time. Now there's lots of it up there. I used to do this crazy thing called Bible quizzing, and I went to a Christian school and all these kind of stuff, right? But when's the last time that I took dedicated time to hide God's word in my heart? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. When Jesus was tempted, what did he do? He just quoted scripture. Isn't that interesting? He didn't argue with Satan. He didn't sit down and try to like figure out, hmm, you know, I'm not sure really where this is coming from or what this is. He just, he just quoted scripture. Quote what else does this portion of scripture tell us? Either about the way Satan attacks us or about the way that Jesus responded. Anything else? It's not a sin to be oh, it's not a sin to be tempted. <laughs> and sometimes that's what's going to happen, right? I think sometimes we can run down this guilt trail of, oh my goodness, I can't believe I would even. I'm going to tell you something, man. Satan, Satan is crazy. He's going to come after you. We're going to see a couple of verses in a minute that deal exactly with that. And so it is not, listen, listen, listen to me, when, when Satan begins to try to bombard you with thoughts, listen, that's not where sin comes into play. Sin comes into play with what we do with those thoughts. Now, let me tell you this at the same time. Uh, let's just use sex stuff, right? Because it's, it's, just, it's just easiest, okay? If throughout my day, 
I am bombarded with sexual thoughts. That is not necessarily sin. But if I look back and I realize that the night before I sat in my room and I watched things that I should not watch, or I entertained thoughts that I should not have entertained, guess what? There's some sin there, right? So even though it's not a sin to be tempted, I've got to ask myself, where is some of this stuff coming from? And if I continually feed it into my life, then I'm just giving Satan a playground to play with it later. And so, so even though in that moment when I'm being tempted in that way, I can look at that and be like, listen, then there's no condemnation because I'm in Jesus Christ and, and Satan, that thought is not from you. But if days before or hours before or whatever, I was putting it in, you see how that works? All right, what else do we see? Yeah, we got um, that our enemy is not stupid. He knows what he's talking about as well. He's not, you know, Jesus wasn't the only one quoting scripture there. All right, did you catch that? Jesus wasn't the only one quoting scripture. And so here's exactly what can happen. Satan masquerades like he walks around like somebody that he's not. And so there are times, I'm just telling you, and this is what makes it confusing. This is why you're like, well, now I'm confused. But the problem is Satan can walk around and he loves to use truth and then twist it. He likes to take things that sound right. And if you look at it just at face value, you're like, man, that, that's good. And then all of a sudden he twists it. And so that's why you and I have to be super careful and realize that not only is he smart and not only does he know our weaknesses, but he also knows the word of God. In fact, chances are, well, not chances are, he does. He knows it better than we do. And so he will use those things against us. Perfect. What else? So I'm saying we, we, we can do this. We don't, yeah. Okay, so like something I've never noticed is, like, I always thought that Jesus just fasted 40 days. And I always wonder why he did that. My Bible actually says that uh, at the end came, at the end came the encourage, um, And it says that he's being tempted for 40 days. Uh -huh. So, like... He was fast, and it says he hasn't eaten any food. So not only was he putting in God's word in his life, he was eating his spirit, but he was starving his flesh at that time when he was being tempted. Yes. He was denying his flesh and feeding his spirit. So that way, like, the things of the flesh, and, you know, I think the temptations of the flesh start to, like, kind of be a little bit more drawn out. And when, when he was tempted and the devil started, like, saying these things to him, the spirit of God rose up, and those verses rose up into him, and I think... That's when he just spoke them with power and then the devil would just be, I mean, he kept coming back, but the devil would shut up about that one thing. Yeah. I love that, right? The devil would shut up about that one thing and then he'd move on to something else. Yeah, right. So that's the other thing you have to realize that Satan, when he comes at you, he's not just going to come at you with one game. He's got, he's got a bunch of games. And so he's going to come at it this way. And that's why it's like a constant fight. And you're like, I'm just tired of the fight. Man, I get that. But he's just going to keep on coming. And so here's the other thing about that, though, really. Again, that's why scripture memory and scripture intake is so important. Now, I've said this before, and I've had people actually argue with me. And so I have no idea whether I'm totally right or not, but I think that I am. God can't bring to mind things that you didn't put in. Now, you're like, oh, God can do whatever he wants. No, no, I understand that. Right? But those but he's not going to bring to mind scripture and you're not going to be able to quote scripture that you haven't put in. And so you and I have to do that dedicated thing of doing that and putting it in. And I want to tell you something. You begin to put it in your heart and in your mind and work to do it. And I guarantee you, you will be amazed at how often it comes to mind. Test me on that. Just, just try it. And you'll be amazed at how often the Holy Spirit brings those things back to mind because you put them in there. Anything else about what Jesus did? And then we'll move on and we'll see some other stuff. Yeah. You mentioned that like, because we're not like Jesus, we always say we can't be like Jesus because we're not God. But in the first verse it says Jesus will be the Spirit. So that's one way that we are like Jesus. Gosh, this is fun. <laughs> right? This is an example of where the Bible is alive. And so part of the reason why I think you and I don't know and see more things in the Bible is because we don't approach it with an open heart to try to learn. Right? You didn't need to come to this power track. You could have sat by the lake and just read John, John, uh, Luke chapter 4. Right? But think about that. Full of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? If you have connected your life through God, through the person of Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. And because He lives in you, it's there. And it's powerful. This is a concept that we've been talking about in my church now for just like a couple of weeks. This whole idea that a lot of times we talk about the fact that we are inviting, what we're inviting Jesus into our 
parts, right? And is that true? Absolutely. But it's not only Jesus inside of us, but we are inside of Jesus. Scripture says both of them. So think about that. I'm in him and he's in me. And he puts his Holy Spirit in us to protect us and to bring things to mind and to convict us and to strengthen us and to guard us. And so I'm going to tell you something. Even though Satan's attacks feel really, really hard on you, and yes, they are, and they're going to cause you a lot of pain, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and Jesus Christ is inside of you, and you're inside of him. And so if you can remember that, it makes a huge difference. All right, we can spend the rest of the time in Luke chapter 4, but I want to go somewhere else. So uh, go here with me. Go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. When I think about spiritual temptation and what am I going to do or how do I stand up against what it is that's happening, I think there are lots of times that people like to go on these battles where like, I'm going to go fight Satan. Let me tell you something. That nowhere are you commanded to go after and try to find Satan. Let me just say that. You're not. This isn't something that it's like, you know what, today I'm just going to go after that dude. I'm going to, uh huh. Look what James 4 7 says. Are you there yet? Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. And what does it say? And he will flee from you. Uh, do you remember what happened at the end of Luke chapter 4? When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him. <laughs> now, here's the deal. Did Jesus go to pick a fight with Satan? No. But the temptation came, and he used the word of God as the answer back. And all these things, the same thing. And the one thing we could have spent time doing is all of those attacks that Satan brought against, or the devil brought against Jesus in the desert, we can figure out what those were. Part of it was against his identity. Part of it was against, like, power. We can look at all of the ways that he kind of came at it. And so even though the questions may have been different to you, I think we could have figured out what are those questions that Satan pounds us with. What are those things that he pounds you with over and over and over again? But this, look what James says. James says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. Now, this idea of resisting, I'm telling you, it's a powerful word, but it's not really an offensive word. Right? It doesn't say, submit yourselves then to God and then go into battle. It just says, submit yourselves to God and resist the devil. And how do we resist the devil? We resist the devil by the same way that Jesus Christ resisted the devil, because the Holy Spirit was in him, and he used scripture. Okay? So on the one hand, this thing of a spiritual battle, it seems crazy. And there's other places that we're going to go, and it talks about, listen, don't be, don't be, don't forget, don't be deceived. You, you, think, that, you think that the world is only about what you see. Right? It's more than just what you see. There's a battle going on, but the way to go after this battle is to humble ourselves before God and to memorize Scripture and to know it and to realize that the Holy Spirit is in us. 1 John 4.4. 4. If you want to turn there, you can. Otherwise, I'll just quote it for you. But write it down. 1 John 4.4. 4. At the end of that verse, listen to what it says. It says, because... Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. You know what the hard part is? It's like I forget that all the time. Because sometimes there are temptations that come my way that seem like I can't handle them. It's bigger than me. Guess what? It is. Don't, don't be mistaken. Because the moment that we begin to think that the temptations that Satan brings our way are not bigger than we are, then, then how do we try to fight them? By ourselves. Right? I mean, by ourselves. And I can do it. And you know what? The interesting thing is, it's possible you can do it for a little while. It is very possible. And so then what happens is, Satan then has the other tactic of, listen, yeah, you did it, but I'm going to come at you again. I'm going to come at you again. And then all of a sudden, our pride gets to the point that instead of running to God when we are tempted, we just run to ourselves. That's, that's, how, that's how crazy Satan is and how schemy he is and how he knows how to do it. So listen, we've got to humble it. How can we humble ourselves before the Lord? How, how can we do that, right? That's what it says. How can we humble ourselves or submit ourselves to God? What are ways that we can do that on a daily basis? What's that? Give thanks to Him. Again, don't we wish there was like these like 
whoa, I never thought of that before. Some of these things aren't those. They're just simple things like giving thanks to God in every situation that's in your life. What else? We can ask God to search our hearts. Uh, we are getting ready to do, uh, I wish you all lived in Pennsylvania and you, you all live close to me because we, we're going to talk about this in church in a couple of weeks. But we can ask God to search our heart. We're going to take a look at Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 in two weeks at our church. And we're going to talk about what it means to pray audacious prayers. And David says, Man, search me and know me. Test me and see if there's anything in me. Here's a very interesting concept. Search me and know me. Test me, David says. Do you realize those are commands? Those are commands. And you may go, I'm not supposed to tell God what to do. Uh, guess what? David did. Now, now be careful with that, right? Yeah. But David did. David gave a, com a command to God. And he said, listen, earlier in Psalm 139, he says, man, you have searched me and you know me. And then he gets down to 23 and 24 and he goes, man, search me and know me. Test me. That's part of the way we can, we can humbly submit to who God is. How else can we do that? We can be thankful. We can ask him to search us. Oh, God, what do you mean by that? Ah. Oh, I like that part. Could you hear how he edited that? Talk about God in your daily life. I'm like, great. And then even when you don't want to. <laughs> even when it doesn't feel right. Even when it's going to feel weird. What is it for us to begin to have conversations not only with God, where we ask God to search us and know us, but in our everyday conversation with people, it just comes up. And what? When it comes up in our everyday, what comes up in your everyday conversations? The things that you're thinking about and the things that you care about. So I'm not being mean, but I'll do it to myself. So at the end of today, today, all I, yesterday, I was obsessed with the fact. I was obsessed with the fact that there wasn't sticks in the corn dogs. Right? How many of you were angry about the fact that there were no sticks in the corn dogs? I was. Yeah. So you know what I did? I went around all day talking to people about sticks and corn dogs. <laughs> Literally. And then last night as I'm falling asleep, I thought to myself, you know what? I talked more about the stickless corn dogs than I did anything about God today. And then I started thinking, why? I'm like, I don't know. And so then I thought, well, maybe it's because I thought it was funny. And I thought if I had conversations with people about the stickless corn dogs, they would think it's funny. And then I'm like, do you understand how it's just a, a weird spiral? And so even when I don't want to, one of the ways that I can sort of keep training my heart and my mind to think about God is force myself to have God conversations. And sometimes even, even Satan's going to use that because you know what he's going to say? He's like, oh, no, 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 no. Doesn't the Bible say that you, you, know, you should have integrity? And you shouldn't deceive people. And that's not authentic. Now, that's a word we like to use, right? That's not being very authentic. Let me tell you something. We have to train ourselves to do it. I think following Jesus Christ and serving Jesus Christ is an acquired taste. I don't think, I don't think it's naturally something that we're just like, ooh, that tastes good. Right? Meaning, is it going to feel good to you to get up early in the morning and read God's word? Probably not at first. But over time, you know what happens? It just begins to become something that you just crave and you want to have more and you want to know more. How else can we submit or humble ourselves before God? One other one before we keep going. Any, any other one? Yeah. Um, actually, I kind of like backtrack for a second. Absolutely. Okay, so like with the James 4 7 verse, huh? it says like to resist the devil himself, but in 1 Corinthians 6, it says, Ah. Yeah? Okay. So did you hear what she said? So there's this part of resisting the devil, and there's also this thing of fleeing away from temptation. And so sometimes Satan can even use that. Let's go back to that. This is how, this is how tricky he is. He's going to say, well, you know, you should be able to stand up under it. So, we'll go back to the sex stuff, right? Sorry, that's just the easiest thing to do. So, uh, it's there. The computer is in your living room. And even though you know you should get up and leave because there's nobody else in the living room who's going to see what you're doing on the computer, Satan may even say, say to you, you can handle it. Right? It don't matter. He's not even telling you or tempting you to go look at bad sights. What he's saying is, you're a grown person. You can handle this. You don't need anyone looking over your shoulder. And so what do we do? We like sort of like, well, I'm going to resist. I'm going to resist. I'm going to resist. No, get up and run. <laughs> and then you, 
may say, well, that just means I must not be a strong Christian. Well, guess what? You're, you may not be. I may not be. Or actually, a strong Christian gets up and runs. <laughs> right? That's the other way to think about it. Or that shows strength. That shows reliance on Him. And so He's going to come in all kinds of different ways. And that's why I'm saying to you, I'm just trying to open your eyes if you haven't seen those before. His schemes are weird and He knows the Scripture. He's going to use the Scripture. He's going to twist it. All right, let's look at somewhere else. Let's keep going, right? Uh, 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9. 1 Peter, because there's two things I want you to see, and chances are, and if you have been in a church that opens God's Word, you've seen these verses of Scripture, okay? But I want to tell you something. I remember one of the times when I found these two verses that we're going to look at, I was like, What? I never saw that before. And so then I started turning in my Bible to find it, and guess what? Both passages were highlighted, and they were starred. <laughs> Which means at some point in my life, I came across these verses, and I was like, whoa, that's powerful. I need to remember it, and then I forgot it. So look, look, look what it says. 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. How many of you are a big fan of that Lion Buddha? Where that song is? It? Man, I love that thing now. So, I mean, it's just powerful. So I find myself like in that room, and I usually have to go like sit by my, stand by myself because I sound horrible when I sing. So I just got to scream it out. And I'm screaming, Lion of Judah, Lion of Judah. Lion. It's awesome. Well, look what, look what the Bible says also about what Satan is and does. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Looking for someone to devour. So I don't know if you knew that, right? So this idea that temptation is coming, it's not just haphazardly. He's on the lookout. He's on the lookout. He wants to destroy you. He wants to eat you for lunch. And so he's going to be looking and he's going to be doing that. And he's going to be coming after us using all kinds of things. Some of it's just desires inside of us. Sometimes it's things we've put in there. But he's coming after us. Look at that. Like a roaring lion looking for someone to what? Devour. Does anybody else have a different word besides devour? Destroy. 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 Devour. He's not just looking to cripple you. Right? This isn't something where it's just like, hey, you know, you're supposed to go run the sprints and you're a hundred yard dasher and now you're, you know, your Achilles hurts a little bit. No, we're talking about take you out type of a thing. That's what he does. That's his plan. And when you and I don't know his plan, then we're not able to resist him. So he's looking around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now look what it says. Resist him. What did James say? Resist the devil and what? He's going to flee from you. Now, what do we realize about what Jesus did in the desert, though? Did the devil, when he resisted the devil, did the devil flee right away? Uh-uh. Didn't the first time? Didn't the second time? And we're only recorded three. It's possible there was even more of them, right? But we know of at least three times. So let me tell you something. When we talk about this thing and resisting the devil, you cannot give up the first time. And you cannot give up the second time. Because he's a roaring lion. Do you think when a lion wants to eat some prey um, out in the safari or wherever he's at, right? That if he doesn't get it the first time, he's like, oh, well. See you later, giraffe. Uh -uh. Keeps going keeps going. Going to chase that gazelle as long as it takes to get it. So you and I have to remember that when we resist, he's not going to stop. But there is a promise that if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And if we resist the devil, eventually he will flee. So this isn't one of those battles that's going to go on forever in these certain situations, but it's just going to keep on, keep on coming. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. Because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Let me tell you something. Sometimes we can think that the temptations that Satan are bringing our way, he's only bringing it to us. And so that's why we keep it quiet, don't we? I do. Now, I also don't think we're supposed to walk around making t-shirts. Well, today I struggle with and walk around with it, okay? But I want to tell you something. When you and I keep sin in the dark, it feeds on itself. When you and I keep quiet about those things that are in our life that are hard, it's just going to feed on itself. And there's other people who are sitting beside you who quite possibly are suffering some of the same temptations that you are. And they're struggling with the same thing, but we're too embarrassed to talk about it. 
Now there's the other side of it, which is sometimes, I'm going to pick on guys, because I'm a guy. Um, guys, sometimes it can happen the other way. A group of guys can sit around and talk about a temptation that seems to come after men a lot, and we give into a lot, possibly. And then we just sit around with it. And before, there was all this guilt and there was all this shame for whatever it is that we've been doing. But now, all of a sudden, we get around a bunch of other guys and we start sharing, like, oh, you struggle with that, too? Man, let's... And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, you do? Oh, I struggle, too. And you do, and you do, and you do. Oh, it must not be that big a deal. Do you see how Satan is that crafty? God says what? Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Share with one another so you don't have to bear up under on your own. And yet Satan is then going to use the fact that you're doing that and sharing with one another to somehow twist it and like, oh, it must not be that big a deal. Because that guy in your youth group or that girl in your youth group that you thought really, really loved God, they struggle with it too. So it must, I'm telling you, he's that crafty. So listen to me. Satan is a roaring lion looking for someone who he may devour. Now, let's go to the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles. That's why I want you to write these down. So let's go 2 Chronicles 16, 9. And this is the one, I'm just telling you, when I saw these two things that like blew my mind. But I'm also simple. So maybe, maybe it's not going to blow your mind. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Try to remember what we just looked at. Right, about, about Satan as a roaring lion, seeking someone he may devour. I, I get the idea that Satan is just walking around looking for someone that he can devour. But look what verse 9 says. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. <laughs> so now take this, right? Take these two ideas and put them side by side. You have got an enemy, the devil, who is like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But you also have the almighty God who is looking and watching for somebody whose heart is fully connected with him. So I want to tell you something. In a battle between those two, do you know who wins? <laughs> right? Praise the Lord. And so we've got this thing and we've got to realize it. So the question is, are we going to humbly submit to the God who's looking with big eyes, trying to find somebody to strengthen, or are we going to give in to the devil's temptation? And scripture is the way for us to do that. All right, one more. Let's just look at one more. There's a couple of we can look at. But 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. 2 Peter 1 Verse 3. And then I'm going to give you some other verses that you can write down. Because we didn't even go to places that you normally go to when you talk about spiritual warfare. Right? You know there's a portion of scripture that talks about all these kind of things that we can put on <laughs> to stand against the attacks. We didn't even go there yet. So there's other places. There's more homework for you to do. But anyway, look what, look what 2 Peter 1, 3 says. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. His divine power has given you and I everything that we need for a life of godliness. So here's the deal. It is at our disposal. The question is, are we going to take it? His divine power has given you and I everything that we need to live a life of godliness. And to live a life of godliness means I'm going to resist the devil. So his divine power has already given you everything you need. And it is very possible that you say, but I just became a Christian. I can't have everything I need. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you if you have accepted the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now we're going to feed that, right? We're going to memorize scripture. We're going to do all these kinds of things. But listen, let me do you. The Holy Spirit is inside of you and he is giving you everything that you need to stand up to those things that the devil is going to throw your way. To live a life of godliness. How though? Do you see what it says next? Through our knowledge of who? Him. Through our knowledge of him. So his divine power has given you and I everything that we need. And how is it done? It's done through a knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ. Why? Because not only is Christ in me, but I'm in Christ. And so you take those two things and you put them like that and nothing's going to be able to tear that apart unless you and I decide to let something get in there. 
unless you and I begin to feed those temptations or we put things into our heart and into our mind. And we, we and I know people, when I used to go to youth conference all the time, they used to have session after session after session after session about the music. We don't even talk about music anymore at Momentum. But I'm telling you, when I was a kid, that was it. Don't put bad music in. Don't put bad music in. I used to remember thinking, really? It's just music. It's not just music. <laughs> Those, those tunes that just come to mind as you're walking around, right? I've had that happen to me before. I'll be driving in the car, and for whatever reason, I choose to turn off the radio, but then I just start singing a song that I heard or something. There's been times I have stopped in the middle and went, what in the world am I singing? <laughs> like, what in the world, right? Why? Because I put it in there, and all of a sudden it comes back, and all of a sudden I'm like, what, what am I doing? So we've got to be careful about those things that we put in, because I want to tell you something, that's one of the ways Satan uses to destroy us, is the things that we choose to put, to put in there. So look what it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through knowledge of Him who has called us, by His own glory and goodness. Every time we look at Scripture, and I'm seeing it more and more and more and more and more, Every time that we are asked to do something, we are given the example of Jesus Christ, or we are shown that all strength and all power, and the only way to do it is in the power of Jesus Christ. And so his divine power has given you everything that you need. But again, Satan's going to use that. You can do this on your own. You've got all the power that you need. You see how you can twist even that verse? His divine power has given you everything you need, but no, you can be like, you have everything that you need. Not without the person of Jesus Christ. Not without him. So realizing that and knowing that's a powerful thing. All right, let's write down a couple of other things because then you'll want to look at them later maybe. If you keep on going in 2 Peter, so I, I wrote down in my notes 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. I wrote that one down. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Let me just read part of 5 for you. For this very reason, make every effort. Now, for this very reason, what did we just talk about? That His divine power has given you everything that you need. So even though His divine power has given you everything that you need to stand up against whatever it is that's coming, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to your goodness knowledge, and to your knowledge self-control, and to your self-control perseverance, and to your perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness love. So listen to you. Do you see how uh, Peter does that? He says, you have every single thing that you need. You do not need anything to be able to stand up. But guess what? Work, work, work. Even though it's available to you, you still should input these things and you should still work on what it means to live godly and what it means to have self-control. Keep going. I said I wasn't going to read this, but it's just too good. Uh, if, verse 8, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, so if you have self-control in your life, but you still continue to work on it through the power of the Holy Spirit in increasing measure, they will keep you, listen to this, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Those areas in your life, He has given you everything that you need, but now you take that and you continue to work on it, it will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Look at verse 9. But if anyone does not have them, so he says, you don't want to be ineffective and unproductive, then work on these things, even though his divine power has given you everything you need. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. <laughs> when you and I do not work on those areas of our life and allowing the Holy Spirit to control our life and to resist the devil, we act like we're blind or nearsighted. You and I act like we haven't been forgiven of something. When we don't do that. All right. How about this one? Write down Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, 11 through 17. And those of you, again, who have like, been trying to memorize scripture, you're like, oh, that's that one, the full armor of God. Yes, that's what it talks about, the full armor of God. And read that and just look at it. And I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes you and I can read the Bible and it makes absolutely no sense. I'll be honest. I just, I'm like, I don't get that. But you know what? More often than not, when you and I sit down, because of God's Holy Spirit is in us, God resides in us, Jesus is in us, and we are in Him, and we have everything that we need, guess what? If we just stop and say, you know what, Holy Spirit, I'm not smart enough <laughs> to understand your word sometimes, and it's really confusing. Will you help me understand it? And then you just, isn't that all we did today was just read a couple of verses and then just talk about them? You can do this on your own. 
And so I would say read that and figure out what, what does that mean? What is the full armor of God and what does that look like and how can I add those things to my life? I think what's really interesting about like once you start to know God's word, like you, you want to like you want to like apply it to your life. So like this is how like you can resist the devil when when he comes to you, like he, he doesn't like you ignored. So rather than just rather than acknowledging you're full of God's word to your situation, you can speak God's word, like in your true situation, but sometimes even in your own word, you just start like praising God or like God, thank you for uh, for like making me like strong. God, thank you for your spirit inside me. Because like whenever you're reading here, it's like saying that we forget that we're cleansed from our past sins. Jesus has cleansed us from these things. We're called to live righteous life. So once you get God's word inside of you. That's how you can resist the devil by speaking, by ignoring him, and <laughs> just essentially ignoring him by speaking the words and just turning, turning on. Like even when it's like hard, like going beyond that feeling of man, I'm struggling with this condition of like shouting out, out to God, like thank you for what you have done in my life, the work of the cross, and what you are doing, and how you are making me right. Absolutely, right. Amen. That's the hard part because it seems like, again, it should be when, I'm telling you, if you and I, when we are tempted, we would stop and pray. If you and I would stop and pray, if you and I would quote scripture or at least grab our Bible or our phone and find it and just start reading it, I am telling you something. You and I cannot intentionally walk into sin and at the same time be praying and reading scripture. It cannot happen. Or if it does, something's really wrong. Right? I mean, literally, how can I be reading scripture and intentionally walking into sin at the exact same time? And so the hard part is it's just going to keep coming, but you and I have to do that. You and I have to figure out a way to take these things to God and to realize that those temptations that are coming our way, even though they feel like they are coming from the inside, they probably are, but we've already been cleansed from them. We've already been cleansed from them. And to realize what that looks like and what that means. So here's the problem. Many of those questions that you guys ask at the beginning, it's possible you're like, well, my question did not get answered. I'm going to be so arrogant to tell you, I think it did. Oh, I think it did. The problem is the answer just seems too simple. <laughs> but I think it did. And I want to tell you this. I want to thank you for coming to this power track. And now all I want to do is I just want to pray for you. And while I'm praying for you, I'm going to pray for myself. Because I want to tell you something. When Satan, I'm not trying to spook you out, but, but when, when Satan sees a group of people who have been called by God, who want to figure out how to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, he's going to use that as a way to attack you. So just know that. So if today's a really poopy day for you, and there's temptation that seems to be coming out of nowhere, realize that Satan's coming after you. So you and I can stand. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, thank you so much for the fact that your divine power has given us everything that we need. That you gave us the example that we can follow, which is to just quote your word. That you tell us to resist the devil and that he will flee from us and that we're supposed to humble ourselves before you. God, help us to know how to do that. Help us to see that. And God, today I now pray for everyone in this room, including myself, that when those temptations come and those thoughts come, whether we planted those seeds hours before or days before or years before, or they just come out of the blue, that today we can begin the practice of resistance. And not in our own strength and not in our own power, but because of what you have done. We do not want to be nearsighted and blind. And we do not want to forget that you have cleansed us and you have made us pure. Because we are in you and you are in us. God, thank you. It is in Jesus' wonderful and precious and glorious name we pray. Amen.